Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what? I, I like Brother Rogers. He talks back to me. Amen. Amen. I like it. You just keep doing that, brother. Amen. You keep talking back to me. I need all the help I can get. Hallelujah. Amen. I got to have one of these fans on. It's hot up here. Maybe it's just me. Hallelujah. Sister, Sister Shelley said, no, it's hot up there. Amen. Amen. Israel in the book of Joshua is in the same place that we stand today on the threshold of a new experience, on the way to a new level of living. They are a new generation holding on to an old promise that has never yet been possessed, but are standing on the precipice of possessing that promise. And I've said this for about seven or eight weeks now. I believe our church is standing on the edge of the greatest revival we've ever had. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. There's an expectation in the air. I feel it. Amen. An expectation in the air. Amen. I feel it rising in the people of God. There's no telling what God's about to do. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Joshua chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan. Thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. As I said unto Moses, amen, we are still in Joshua generation, amen. And this is part seven, and uh, I think there's going to be a part eight, because <laughs> I'm not going to get done with, with Joshua 24 tonight, amen, amen. I want to talk to you tonight about this, a place called Shechem, a place called Shechem, amen. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your awesome power and presence that is in this place. I pray now that you'd anoint my lips, allow, uh, allow them to speak the words of God as the oracle of God. I pray, God, that you would help us. Lord, just open our hearts, our minds, our souls. Let us receive the word of God. Lord, I pray that you would just help me, God. Fill my mind with the things that need to be said. Close my mouth to the things that do not. I pray for your anointing to rest upon my mouth and my heart, God. Lord, in my mind. And I pray, God, your, your anointing would also rest upon your people, Lord, and give us uh, ears to hear and hearts to receive. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Somebody said in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. I don't know if uh, uh, those of you that are on social media, if you saw, amen, that we have uh, officially uh, launched our recovery, amen, and we are uh, moving uh, rapidly towards uh, having our classes up and going. That's going to kick off on May the 7th, and we've already had uh, at least one person reach out to us, uh, and uh, so that's the first step in let me back up. That's not the first step. That's one of the steps. We've made many steps thus far, but that's one of the steps that will be leading us to opening our recovery uh, house. And uh, so we're, we're getting closer to that. Amen. So I'm very thankful and very excited about that. So, amen. Last week we talked about the last will and testament of Joshua. Anybody remember that? We kind of went line by line through an a expository teaching of Joshua chapter 23, you know, expository teaching is verse by verse teaching, and we did that last week, and we're going to kind of stay in that vein tonight, but I have a feeling I may not get very much past verse 1, uh, uh, so so I know I got at least uh, another week because I'm still not got to the scripture I really want to get to, amen. I think it was important for us to hear last week what was in the heart of that now aged man of God named Joshua as he approached the end of his life. He was coming to the end of his life and it was very important for us to hear what he wanted to say to the people of Israel. I don't have time to go back and reteach that. I think most everyone was here last week for that teaching. If you wasn't, it's on our Facebook page. You can go back and pick it up because it is important. Amen. But I want to jump right into Joshua chapter 24 tonight. 
and see what the Word of the Lord has in store for us. Amen. I will say this, that, that chapter 23 and chapter 24 are very similar. Amen. 23 is a historical view and 24 is, is the official review for future generations. Amen. And there's even debate over whether these, uh, these two chapters are referring to the same called meeting or if they are two separate distinct gatherings. In other words, uh, there's debate whether Joshua had two different calling if he called Israel together and talked to them in Joshua 23 and if there's a second uh, time when he called them together in Joshua 24 either way whether there was two different meetings or if they're the same meeting either way Joshua is sending the same message in both chapters he was trying in all of his wisdom all of his strength, all of his, uh, all of his love to reiterate, to clarify, and to empathize, amen, the importance of this message to the next generation. He was trying to get it across to them. He, it was so important that some of the very same things he said in Joshua 23, he said again or, uh, or it's written again in Joshua 24. So much so that let's, let's see how Joshua 24 starts. Joshua 24 verse 1. The Bible says, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Now, if you will notice with me, just as in chapter 23, Joshua calls for Israel to come together, right? He calls them, making sure that the elders and the, the heads of the tribes and families, the judges and the officers are all drawn in close to him Amen. That they might be able to hear the final words uh, of this man of God. No doubt, as I told you last week, his voice, because he is very aged, no doubt his voice is probably weak and probably a little raspy. And, and, and I can just see as a holy hush probably fell over that great congregation as Joshua began to speak. So it's very uh, similar, amen. We have the same uh, passage of Scripture in Joshua 23 where he gathers Israel together and he calls for the elders and the heads of the tribes and families and judges and officers. So we can see the parallels between 23 and 24. But there's a very important detail found in Joshua 24 that was not found in Joshua 23, the Bible says, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. Somebody say Shechem. 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 Amen. This place called Shechem has a great deal of significance in Scripture. Amen. A lot can be learned and gleaned from examining Shechem. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Amen. Shechem is a city or is a city in Manasseh. Amen. It was also one of the six cities of refuge that we spoke of a couple weeks ago. It was located in the valley between Mount Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Shechem was literally a valley of decision. I want you to think about this. It it lied between these two mountains. It was a valley of decision. Uh, Joshua called Israel to that valley, and some 14 verses later he instructed them, Choose you this day whom you will serve. He brought them to this place, right? It was a valley of decision. Amen. Somebody say valley of decision. That's what Shechem was. He brought them to this place called Shechem so that he could get them to understand the importance of the decisions that they made. 
my mind went to a scripture in Joel, Joel chapter 3, verse 14. Brother Bird, it says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. It said, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Amen. Decisions are important. They're important. Amen. Every one of us face uh, face a place called Shechem. This place of decision. Every one of us at times in our lives are called to that valley where we stand and we have to make decisions that have eternal consequences. Amen. We are brought to a place. Amen. And I believe that God is calling us now to come to Shechem and say, okay, God, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. And we're going to make some decisions right here in this valley. Amen. That are going to forever change our, our, uh, our projection, the direction, amen, that we are headed. Amen. And that happens at a place called Shechem. Amen. Does anybody know that God knows the end from the beginning? Amen. He knows the end from the beginning. And I want you to watch this through Scripture tonight, the importance of Shechem. Uh, God already had this day in mind back in the book of Deuteronomy. Before they ever came into the promised land, before they ever conquered any territory, before Joshua ever got, ever got old and was about to pass from this walk of life, amen, uh, God already had this in mind. Let me give you some scriptures. Deuteronomy 11 and 26, it says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass, listen to what he said, it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount uh, Ebal. So right there in the middle of Gerizim and Ebal, Amen. Israel, you are going to have you're going to have an opportunity to choose either a blessing or a curse, to choose life or to choose death, to choose victory or to choose defeat. You're going to Israel. You're going. I'm go there's going to be a time in your future. When you're going to be called to this valley that stands between these two mountains, this place called Shechem, and in that place of decision, you're going to get to choose prosperity or poverty. You're going to get to choose freedom or you're going to get to choose slavery. I'm going to bring you back to this place. There's a blessing here, but there's also a curse here, and the choice is, is on you. The decision is yours. Can I tell you today that when we, when God brings us to a place of decision, we have those same choices. I choose to be blessed. Come on now. I choose to be blessed. Amen. I'm blessed when I go in and when I come out. Amen. Come on now. Let me tell you tonight. I'm going to choose to be blessed. Whether everything's going good in my life, I still choose life. Amen. Whether, whether I'm in the midst of a battle, I'm still going to choose victory. Amen. Whether I've got a, 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 a money in the bank or whether I don't have any, I'm going to choose the prosperity of the Lord. Come on. I want to talk to you tonight. Amen. I choose to be free and not be bound. I've come to tell us tonight. Amen. As God brings us to a place called Shechem, we have the decisions that we can make and as for me amen I want to choose the blessings of God I wish I had a witness tonight that say I want to choose the blessings of God amen amen and that happens at that place called Shechem there there must be a conscious choice a, and a decision made as to whether you will serve God or you will live for yourself. 
You'll serve God or you'll serve this world. See, God calls us, every one of us. He deals with us. He pulls us. The, the, the Spirit of God draws us to a place called Shechem. Amen. Can I tell you tonight that oftentimes that's our altars. Oftentimes that's a place when the Word of God goes forth and it pricks our heart. Amen. It begins to minister to us. Sometimes conviction comes. Amen. Sometimes it's the love of God that's so overwhelming. But what it is, it's God pulling us to this place of decision. It's God drawing us to a place where we will come and we'll say, you know what? I'm going to live for God. I'm making a decision today that's going to change my eternity. That's going to change my destination. Amen. It's going to change the path I was on. It's going to change my direction. That's what repentance is, a change of direction. And that can only happen at a place called Shechem, a valley of decision. Amen. I hope I'm making sense tonight. Amen. I want you to hear this statement. Decisions made in the valley will either solidify your relationship with God or they will separate, separate you from your relationship with God. Amen. I'm going to say it again. Decisions made in the valley will either solidify your relationship with God or they will separate you from your relationship with God. We have to be careful of the decisions we make in the valley. Amen. They'll either solidify us or they'll separate us. Amen. They'll either draw us near to God or they'll push us away from God. Be careful of the decisions you make in a valley. Oh, you need to hear me. Amen. When you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, don't decide to throw in the towel on God. Amen. Because it's when, I, when I'm walking through that valley that I need Him the most. Amen. When I'm coming through those low places in life, Amen. It's it's not time to make a decision that I'm gonna I'm gonna back up or go away. I'm just gonna turn my back on God. No, my friend, it's in that place where you need to solidify your relationship with God and say, you know what? The same God that was with me on the mountain is the same God that's gonna be here with me in the valley. Amen. The God that leadeth me beside the still waters is gonna be the God that's gonna be here with me right now in the midst of my when my enemy's there. Amen. He's gonna prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. That God. God that I'm serving, I want to solidify my relationship with Him in the valley. Amen. 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 Beware of the decisions you make in the valley. Hallelujah. So, Joshua called all of Israel to this valley called Shechem. The historic and spiritual significance of Shechem cannot be understated. Shechem is like a play, like maybe like our president standing on the White House lawn, or my mind thought about George Bush standing on top of the rubble at at, at the side of the World Trade Centers. Amen. At that tragedy. When they said, uh, we can't hear you. And he said, well, I can hear you. And I'm, this is a partial quote. I'm not sure I exact, got it exactly right. But he said, I can hear you. And the ones that knock down these buildings are about to hear from us. Amen. Something to those effect. And that is forever etched in my mind. I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing when that happened. I remember watching that and it being so... Uh, inspiring so uh so uh just made my patriotism rise amen and I, and i remember uh, i was just young but i remember uh ronald reagan telling uh, Mr. Gorbachev, if you're if you're serious about this, tear down this wall. And I remember the backdrop of that. And I and, and so it is that I, I'm giving you something you can relate to tonight for you to understand that when Joshua called them to Shechem, when he brought them there, Amen.
Amen. It was to a place, Amen, that perhaps brought back their brought their memories back of the promises and the covenants that God had given to them. Amen. So when He called Israel to this place called Shechem, to this valley of decision, when He called them to Shechem, that was so important because it was etched in Israel's mind. Amen. Hey, we've been here before. Hey, there's some important things that's happened at Shechem before, and I'm going to talk about them in just a minute. But he was bringing them to a place, amen, that, that, that would remind them of the promises of God, of the co covenants of God. He was, he was bringing them there, amen. He wanted it to, to be forever etched in their minds. Are, are you following me tonight? Man. So, he brings them to a place called Shechem. Many years earlier, Brother Andrew, you ready to read for me? Many years earlier, Genesis 12, we're going to read Genesis 12. Many years earlier, God had visited a man by the name of Abraham. At this very spot, this place called Shechem. I want you to think about it. If you go back to Genesis, from Joshua to Genesis, hundreds of years have, have transpired, have passed. And God knew, because He's an all-knowing God, and because He already had it planned out, Amen. That there's going to be a day when Joshua, this great man of God, this great leader, after they've come in and possessed the land, he, God already had it planned out. There's going to be a day near the end of his life where he's going to stand and declare unto Israel what needs to be said. Amen. And he said, so I want it to be such a significant place. Amen. I'm going to give a promise in that place that he can reiterate at the end of his life, and this is the promise, Genesis 12 and 6. Let's read it, Brother Andrew. And Abram passed through the land to the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And he built there an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. All right. I want you to understand something. That word Sikkim there is, is also Shechem. Amen. And it is the exact same place. It was the place. I want you to notice the verse. He said, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord. Amen. There, this place called Shechem was not only a valley of decision, but it was also a place of promise. Amen. I want, I want this to seep into your spirit tonight. Shechem is important. Amen. It was a place of decision, but it was also a place of promise. God promised them. It was here that God gave Abraham the promise of possessing that land. Amen. The very fact that, that all Israel is now standing at Shechem, amen, is a testimony of the faithfulness of of God. It took years to come to pass. Amen. It took generations for it to come to pass. They had their highs and they had their lows. They had their battles and they had their scars. But can I tell you, where God first originally promised it at Shechem, He now after it's been possessed and at the end of Joshua's life, He brings them back to that place and tells them this is the place it was promised to us. It's a place of promise promise and now look at the faithfulness of God he gave us what he said he would amen amen let me tell you amen it was a testimony of the faithfulness of God numbers 23 and 19 declares unto us God is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent he hath said and 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 shall he not do it or hath it hath he hath he spoken and it 
he shall not make it good. In other words, if God gives you a promise, I, I'm not talking about something you dreamed up because you had too much dominoes last night. I'm not talking about something, you know, a nightmare in the middle of the night that you had, amen. I'm talking about something, amen, not something that's going to just benefit you, amen, but I'm talking about a God-given promise, amen. If you get one of those from the Lord, can I just tell you, you can count on it, amen. You can take it to the bank. I don't mean the Silicon Valley Bank either. <laughs> hallelujah. That ain't in my notes, but that's pretty good. Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Let me tell you tonight. He is, he is faithful to fulfill whatever he has promised you. Well, man, I, I, I got, I, I'm going to have to talk about that. I can already tell. I didn't get one amen. I didn't get one amen. Amen. We, we, we got to know and understand, if God gives you a promise, He is faithful to bring it to pass. Amen. Thank you. Amen. I've come to tell you tonight that whatever it is, I don't care how big the dream is. I don't care how big the, 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 the promise is. God can give it to you, and if He promises it to you, He is faithful to bring it to pass. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me ask you a question. When Abram walked through the walked through that land, and he was he looked around, he saw all that all the all the things, all the uh, uh, enemies that lived in that land, how it was possessed, he meant how it was how, how there was walled cities, all this kind of stuff. Don't you think that Abraham thought, man, this is a big promise, man, this is this is this God may have to roll up his sleeves for this. If you fast forward several hundred years, there were 12 spies that went in. And 10 come back and said, well, it's all God promised it was. It, was. it flows with milk and honey. Look at the fruit of this thing. We're carrying it between two of us. It's great. But then they begin to uh, bring up an evil report, the Bible said. And, 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 and before long, they had talked themselves right out of the promises of God. And that, if we're not careful, that's what happens. God gives us a promise, and we start speaking doubt and disbelief into it, and we start the naysayers start saying that'll never come to pass. That'll never happen. They're, they're, not, they're never going to get that. Ne they'll never have that. But can I tell you right now, the devil is a liar. Well, hallelujah, anyhow. I've come to tell somebody tonight, amen, that God is faithful. And when he confirms his word, he confirms his promises unto you. Can I tell you, it may not happen in my time, but it's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. Hallelujah. Let me just go ahead and dive into this while I'm talking about it. I drive by that building on Highway 72 every day, every day. And I don't know how God's going to do it, but I know this for sure. I've been, I've walked around that building. I've had prayer meetings in the parking lot. I've had it confirmed by two elders, amen, in the last month, amen. Can I tell you right now, and both of those men of God said, this is absolutely the will of God. And I don't know how it's going to come to pass, but it is going to come to pass. We're going to have that building in Jesus' name. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know I got a word from God. I know I got a promise from him. Amen. And I believe it without, without a shadow of doubt. And the devil can say it all he wants to, but I've come to tell, I've come to serve notice, notice on him today. He's a liar, but my God is faithful. He keeps his promises. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He is faithful to fulfill whatever he has promised you. Amen. The thing about God's promises are they rarely come to pass when you expect them to. Amen. They, they rarely come to pass when you expect them to. I thought, man, I thought by now this would something already transpire. Anybody been there? You nodding at me. I'm talking to you now. I can tell. I got your attention. Amen. And, 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 but they rarely come to pass when we expect them to. But you got to get this in your spirit. That even though they don't happen when we thought they were going to, does not change the fact that they're still going to come to pass. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel good tonight. Let me tell you something. Mary and Martha thought Lazarus was going to show up and... Heal their brother Lazarus. Guess what happened? He died. He said, 
Nazareth is dead and I'm glad. That's not where the verse ends, but I mean, it depends on where you put the comma. <laughs> It's what, it's what it says. <laughs> Jesus says, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad. I mean, keep reading, but anyway. <laughs> but let me tell you, it wasn't the will of God for him to show up and heal Lazarus. Why? Because they knew he was a healer already. He had opened blinded eyes. He had, he had done all manner, all manner of miracles. But one thing they had never seen him do was have power and dominion over death. So when he got to the grave that day, oh, don't roll the stone away. He stinks. He's been dead four days. And Jesus said, hey, just roll it away. I'm fixing to show you my power. And he caught, God, I'm out of my notes so much. We ain't never going to get done with this series. He called him out of that grave. Can I tell you? It was a promise for God, and it came to pass. But it happened in his time, not in Mary and Martha's time. I hope I'm ministering to somebody. Amen. Can I move on? Amen. So Shechem is a place of promise. It's a place of promise. See, the thing about God is His timing is not always our timing. Matter of fact, I found out in my life, it's very rarely my timing. Hmm. Hear me. If you will be faithful, God will be faithful. If you'll be faithful, God will be faithful. Shechem is a place of promise. And then Joshua spends the next 13 verses. Brother Andrew's going to read them because I want us to, to walk through them just a little bit. He spends the next 13 verses reminding Israel of how good and faithful God has been to them. He calls them to this place called Shechem. He gets them there, gets all the elders and all the officers and all the judges and, and, and all the leaders of, the, of, of their families, and he brings them up close, and he begins to tell them, and he begins to talk to them. But the first thing he does is he reminds them of his faithfulness. Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. Read for me, Brother Andrew. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. So, so let me just pause there. He's painting the picture of where the promise came from to where they are today. He is telling them where their heritage was. And he's bringing them through Abraham to Isaac, Jacob and Esau. And now he said, Jacob, they went down to Egypt. Read. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And now, afterward, me, hold I brought on, hold you. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. I got to say something. I got to say something. You got to understand that the generation he is talking to, they were not in Egypt. All them died because of their unbelief in the wilderness. Can I tell you something? An unbelieving spirit will make you die in the wilderness. I, I don't want to have that. I want to have faith to believe God can do anything. Amen. R read, read. And afterward I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and ye came into the sea. And the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians yeah. and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt, and ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side, Jordan. Time out. He said, and you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. You know whose fault it was they stayed in the wilderness so long? Their own. Their own. 
God never intended for them to be in the wilderness that long. Sometimes the wilderness that we're stuck in is our own fault. All right, I'm just going to move on past that. Let you let that marinate a little bit. Read. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side, Jordan. And they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand that ye might possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. You can't curse what God's already blessed. Amen. Can I tell you, you can be a prophet of doom if you want to. Amen. You, you, can, you can say whatever you want to say, but can I tell you tonight that God's going to bless it anyhow? God's going to bless it anyway. Amen. Because we're a blessed people. We're a Joshua generation. Right, right? And I ain't got time to get in. Move on. I got a bunch more to go. Here we go. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet from before you, which drave them out from before you, <laughs> even the two kings of the Re Amorites. Read that again. I sent what? The hornet before you. I, lo I love this. I love this. <laughs> God said, you got all these ites that you're having to deal with. Oh, am I right? You got Brother Andrew did a great job calling all them off. I'm just gonna call them the ites. You you got all these ites that you're having to deal with. Amen. And God said, You're not even gonna have to fight them. I, I'm gonna run them off. I'm gonna send a bunch of hornets down there. I love the fact that God fights for his people. Amen. You need to remember that. That God God's not on your side. You're on his side. Amen. And God is fighting for us. Amen. And he'll do what at one point, at one point, God sends hell down. And killed, the Bible says he killed more with the hell than he, di than he did than they did with the sword. If God has to rain down hell from heaven. That's kind of funny, ain't it? <laughs> If he has to do that, he'll, he'll take care of the enemy one way or another. Amen. If he has to send a bunch of hornets to, to get somebody out of the way, guess what he'll do? He'll do what he's got to do. Amen. Because that's the kind of God. Because you can't stop the promises of God. R read on. i, I got to get to where I'm going. Read. Which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword nor with thy bow. You didn't do it with your sword or with your bow. And I have given you a land from which you did not labor. Oh, hallelujah. Listen to this. This is the point I want to get to, right? So he's telling them, Joshua's telling them, hey, I brought you to Shechem, we're out, but I got to remind you, I got to remind you of all that God has done for you. Amen. And he said, and I will give, I have given you the land which you did not labor. Read. Cities which you build not. You didn't build them, but you're living in them. Of the vineyards and olive yards which he planted not. Do you, ye eat? You're going to eat from vineyards and olive yards that you didn't plant. Amen. And one place said you're going to drink from wells you didn't dig. Can I tell you tonight? That's what God's promises do. Amen. And Joshua is trying his very best, amen, to remind them. It's his last public address to Israel. And he's taking time to remind them, to reiterate, amen, to clarify. Amen. To empathize uh, to all of Israel. Amen. All that God has done for them. He wanted them to make sure that they understood because he's speaking to a generation that didn't come through the flood. Through a generation that, come on, that didn't that did not, uh, didn't pass through the Red Sea. The, a generation that didn't come out of Egypt. A generation that, come on, now, he's talking to them and telling them, reminding them of all the things God had 
done for them. And he wants to make sure before he leaves that you are reminded of how faithful God has been. Now, not only was Shechem a place of promise, not only was it a valley of decision, but it was also a place of consecration and separation. Let me help you with it. It's 8 o'clock. I'll try to hurry. Genesis 35, verse number 1. Brother Andrew, if you read for me. And God said unto Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in the land and all their earrings which were in their ears. Back and up and read that again. And they gave, read it again. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and yes. all the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. Where did he put them? Under an oak at Shechem. Now, let me just talk to you. The Bible said he hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. That word hid literally means to bury. He buried them under the oak. Let me just talk to you. A lot of things need to be buried underneath a tree called Calvary. Mm, I want that to settle down deep. Jacob buried those strange gods under a tree. And I can't think of a better place to bury my strange gods, the things that I used to serve, than under Calvary's tree. Amen. There's not a better place, amen, for me to lay down some stuff Amen. Then at a valley of decision, at a place of promise, can I talk to you now? Can I tell you? It's at that valley of decision that the promise of the Father can be given unto you. Amen. God, there's so many tie-ins here. I don't have time to teach it all. But let me just tell you, it happens there. But hear me, a lot of things have to, there's separation that comes at that same valley. It calls for consecration and separation. And there's not a better place to get rid of our strange gods that had a place called Calvary. Oh, I hope I'm making sense. Here at Shechem, Jacob had to purge his household from all the strange gods and idols. See, when we get to Shechem, this place of decision, this place of promise, this place of consecration, this place of separation, God calls us to put off those Old things. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 22. It says that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. If you will notice with me, amen, the apostle uh, is telling us, amen, the apostle Paul is telling us, there are some things you got to put off, the old man, amen. And that's exactly what Jacob did at Shechem, amen. He took those things that had been had been uh, worshipped and things that had been idols in his life and in his family, and he said, you know what? We're going to bury them beneath, come on now, beneath the oak that's at Shechem. In other words, for today what it means, I'm going to bury that at the foot of the cross. Amen. I'm going to put it beneath the cross, and I'm going to put off the old man, and I'm going to put on the new man, and I'm going to come out of this thing, and I'm going to leave this valley with my mind made up. I'm walking in newness of life. Amen. God, help me tonight. Amen. Colossians 3 and 8 says, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, out of your lie, lie, 
you're out of your mouth. Amen. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. I love what he said there. Put off. Put off anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Amen. Put off those old deeds. Can I tell you, we need to every now and then step back and check the man in the mirror and say, okay, God, have I put off this stuff? Do I have anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication coming out of my mouth? Am I lying about somebody or lying to somebody? If I am, I need to step back and I need to look myself in the, in the mirror and say, okay, God, your word is convicting me. It needs to get a hold of my life, and I need to make some changes, and that can only happen at Shechem. Man, and when I get out of Shechem, I can leave there a new man. I told you, I'm not going to get through verse 1 tonight. Just I'm talking about Shechem, a place called Shechem. Amen. I, I, I'm hastening, I'm hastening. Hey Amen, hear me. When you get to Shechem, there will be not only an inward change, but also an outward change of appearance, a change of garments. Jacob told him, Take off the gods that's on your hands. Take off the earrings. Amen. He told him, he said, change your garment. Clean yourself and change your garment. Jacob told them to take off those rings. Amen. To get rid of those things. Amen. There was an inward change that happened, but there was also an outward change that had to happen. Are you with me tonight? Can I tell you right now that when you get to a place called Shechem, when you get to the foot of Calvary, when you finally get there and you decide, I'm burying some stuff, when, when you get there, there will be a change inwardly and a change outwardly. I didn't expect you to shout there, but it's the truth anyhow. Amen. Amen. Jacob knew. He knew and we know that when we're approaching God, he requires a totally new outlook. Amen. One must divest themselves from the idolatrous images and practices obtained in the world. We have to separate ourselves because that's what Shechem is. It's a place of separation. That's what Jacob did. He had to separate himself from the things that he brought with him. He had to separate himself. Jacob had an awareness that such things, amen, uh, were not desirable when approaching the one true God. There was a, a consciousness that such things that were, that were worn, amen, they had to be a change, amen. There had to be a, 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 a shifting. Why? Because he understood that when you're coming to this one true living God, that there needs to be an inward change and an outward change. I hope I'm making sense. Can I tell you, thank you, Brother Rogers. Can I tell you tonight that Shechem is so important? It's a valley of decision. It's a place of promise. It is a place of separation and consecration. All that happens at Shechem. And Brother Melton, when Joshua brought them to that place called Shechem for his final address, for his final message to them, amen, it was literally the state of the union. He was declaring unto them, hey, this is going to be the last time I'm going to get to address you. And he, was, he brought them specifically to Shechem. Because he wanted them to remember all the faithfulness of God. And he brought them to that place between those two mountains and said, I'm bringing you to this valley of decision. And I'm bringing you to this place. Amen. To this place of promise, Sister Tara. To this place that's calling us to be separate from the world. Because if you keep reading, and we'll get there next week. Amen. If you keep reading, that's what he goes into. Hey, all the gods of the, uh, uh, of the enemy around you, don't go back to them. Don't let them 
uh, drag you back to the, the, the world. Amen. Don't let them pull you back into that. If you remember back to last week's lesson in Joshua 23, that's the same message, and that's what he was telling. you got to separate yourself from that. Does that make sense tonight? Stand with me. I'm trying to, I'm trying to close. Joshua's reminding them. He's reminding them of the covenant that God had made. And he tells them this in verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. You know what Joshua's doing? He's driving home the fact that you can't serve two masters. You can't serve the gods of, of the pagans around you. You can't walk in the idolatrous ways that I brought you out of. And he's telling them, you can't do that and serve God too. Shechem calls us to a place of consecration and separation. Shechem is so important. Brings us to a place of decision. It's a place of promise. It's a place of separation and consecration. I'll pick up there next week. Let's pray. Mighty God, we love you. I thank you, Lord, tonight. I felt your anointing and your power in this house. I pray that I've ministered to somebody in this place. That the word of God, you're, you promised that it would not return void. I'm praying, Lord, that you would allow it to seep down deep into our spirits. God, let it stir in us, in our hearts, in our minds. And God, help us to bury a lot of things beneath Calvary. God, bring us to this place of decision, this place of promise, this place of separation. And let us make the changes we need at Shechem. Every one of us need a place called Shechem. And I pray, God, that I'd make the right decisions in my valleys. Thank you, God, for your great people. Thank you for every person that's here tonight. I ask, God, that you would go with us, keep your hand upon us, strengthen and encourage us, God, and let this word just continue to, to saturate our minds. We thank you for